Of all the superheroes, my favorite is Batman, and a lot of people agree, but why is it? Is it his dark image, or the fact that he's mostly based in a realistic setting, not using any superpowers? I don't know, he's just cool. But with all the different film adaptations, everyone has their own ideas of how they like their Batman. But anyway, I'm just a regular fan, so I'm going to give my own reviews of all the live-action Batman movies and express my own opinions. I won't get into the animated series just because there's too much to cover, so check it out. It's a mini-marathon, there's going to be three parts going through the history of the Batman movies, from the early days up until Dark Knight. It's Cinemassacre's Batathon! First, I want to draw your attention to a 1926 silent chiller called The Bat. The plot involves a group of people in an old mansion who are being stalked by a killer who wears a bat mask and cape. He's not as famous as Dracula or the Frankenstein monster, but the fog and creepy atmosphere make this a great addition to the Haunted House franchise which was going on around the time. But you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Well, quite simply because it's the inspiration for Batman. Yeah, when you see him climbing up the roof with the grappling hook, how could you not draw the comparison? But if that's not enough, he even uses the bat signal. Obviously, it's one of the biggest trademarks of Batman, but instead of the police using it to contact Batman, the bat uses it to frighten his enemies before he comes in for the kill. In 1933, the same director, Roland West, remade his own film as The Bat Whispers. Batman creator Bob Kane has said that this was the film that inspired him to create the character, so in some weird kind of way, The Bat is actually the first Batman movie and I bet you didn't even know it existed. And now for the rating, I give it three bats out of five. In 1939, the Batman made his first appearance in Detective Comics number 27. It didn't take too long before the character made it to the big screen, with Lewis Wilson being the first actor to play Batman in a 15-part serial. Right as it begins, you see Batman sitting at a desk with a bunch of bats flying around on strings. Most people's reaction would be to laugh, and honestly, it's pretty funny. The costumes look like the equivalent of what you could buy at a Halloween store. It seems like they should have gotten a black cape for Batman. Whatever hue they chose just didn't photograph too well in black and white, so we have a very gray looking Batman. Robin's extremely young, fitting the boy wonder image, but again, he comes off as kind of silly and he looks like Eraserhead. Besides, he doesn't really have much interesting to say or do. The villain, Dr. Daka, was invented purely for the film and never appeared in any of the comics. He's a Japanese scientist who uses some kind of electrical device to turn people into mindless zombies, I guess. He's a stock cliché straight out of the mad scientist genre. The worst part is his phony accent. Of course, this was right in the middle of World War II, so there's an anti-Japanese tone to the whole thing, which makes it extremely outdated and just not right. They don't even drive the Batmobile, instead it's just a regular car. But keep in mind, the comics were still in their premature state and gradually developed the Batmobile over time. But one thing that can be said, the film serial introduced the Batcave. Here it's called the Bats Cave. While not the most technically sophisticated film, it's interesting to watch and a fascinating piece of history. But this one's for hardcore fans only. I give it two and a half bats on a string. In 1949, another serial was produced, Batman and Robin. The villain this time was another made-up, half-assed attempt called The Wizard. Not a whole lot is different from the first one, and again, I recommend it only for the hardcore fans. So, let's move on. I give it two Bat Cars. In 1966, well into the age of television, Batman made his TV debut. It begins with an animated intro with a surf music theme. The only lyric is Batman chanted over and over again. Another trademark are the choppy fist fights. Now let's talk about the characters. Batman's played by Adam West. The man has a great voice. To this day, people like to debate who is the best Batman. But West is so memorized as the role, I like to convince myself he really is Batman. Robin's played by Burt Ward, definitely sort of downplayed as the sidekick and delivering some of the funniest overacted lines of dialogue ever. Holy molars, am I ever glad I take good care of my teeth. Throughout the show, there is a whole gallery of villains. The Joker, played by Cesar Romero. Riddler, played by Frank Gorshin. Egghead, played by Vincent Price. Catwoman, played by a number of actresses. The Penguin, played by Burgess Meredith. And Mr. Freeze, also played by a number of actors. Here he looks like Darth Vader without the mask. All the villains are completely crazy. It's overacting at its finest. The episodes would often end on a cliffhanger, much like the old serials. And as the series went on, it started to wear out and get ridiculous. 
And what always sticks out to me is when Batman and the Joker go surfing. But still, it's very amusing, and a lot of the time the show plays as a deliberate comedy. A lot of people like to describe it as campy, and if that's a bad thing, then sign me up, because I love it. Only problem, the show's never been released on DVD. There's some kind of legal issue going on, so for now you just gotta catch it on TV if it ever comes on. So, I'd say go buy it, but you can't. I give the show three and a half surfing jokers. Even though it only ran for a couple years, it has a total of 119 episodes and a feature film, Batman the Movie. The movie brings together four of the villains, the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler, and Catwoman. It's great stuff. My favorite scene is when Batman's running around with a live bomb trying to find a safe place to throw it away. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. It also has one of the most terrifying sharks ever. Jaws eat your heart out. No, actually it's ridiculous, but it's awesome, as long as you appreciate the campiness. Today, a lot of Batman fans hate the 60s series, like it tainted the image of Batman or something. And if you prefer a more serious approach to Batman, that's fine, I do too. But I like them both, it's a different kind of Batman. No matter what you say, this Batman is important because this is the show that launched Batman into the pop culture and introduced so many people to the character. I can vouch for myself because I grew up watching reruns of the show in the 80s. It's classic. I give the movie four killer sharks. But remember, you gotta put that in perspective. In 2003, Adam West and Burt Ward reunited as themselves in a television movie, Return to the Batcave. The plot involves them searching for the stolen Batmobile. Frank Gorshin and Julie Newmar both return as the Riddler and the Catwoman. Other than just the novelty of a reunion, it's not that great, but the best parts which make it worth seeing are the reenactment scenes where they flash back on memories from the making of the TV series. It's a funny and affectionate celebration of two guys who were on the top of the world making a crazy show and all the adventures that they got into while filming. I give it three Robin crotches. Stay tuned next week for part two. It's Cinemassacre's Batathon. Now we're moving on to the more current generation of Batman movies. Ideas for a new Batman movie were floating around through most of the 80s. The 1986 graphic novel The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller was darker and more serious than the Batman that most people know. Most people at the time only knew about the 60s series, but among the hardcore Batman fans, they wanted a more serious and badass approach. And it was about time. In the directing chair was dark visionist Tim Burton. But once Michael Keaton was announced as Batman, there was an outcry from the fans who hated this decision. They were actually petitioning and the internet didn't even exist. The focus was all on this one movie he did, Mr. Mom, which I have to admit was actually one of the first movies I ever saw in a theater. But if you saw Beetlejuice, you'd see how versatile Michael Keaton can really be. And as far as Batman, he was great. That smirk on his face, that's something only he can pull off. As Bruce Wayne, he's also good. He's so unassuming, just like a regular guy. His manner and the curious look on his face, you can just read his thoughts. The scene where he's trying to tell Vicki Vale that he's Batman, but he just can't get the words out of his mouth, that's a great example of his performance. So, bottom line, Michael Keaton was a great Batman. But the actor that steals the show is Jack Nicholson as the Joker, one of the all-time greatest villains in a motion picture. The guy is so demented and evil, but so funny at the same time. It actually makes you laugh along with him and feel guilty about it afterward. How can you not laugh at a guy with a permanent smile? <laughs> One of my favorite lines comes right here. What do you want? My face on the one dollar bill. It's like he didn't expect the question, so he had to think about it for a second. And why would he want his face on the dollar bill? That's like the most egotistical thing I've ever heard. The hero-villain relationship is probably the most well done I've ever seen. First of all, the Joker killed Batman's parents. If that doesn't make him his enemy, then nothing would. And in return, the Joker hates Batman for stealing his attention, HE STOLE MY BALLOONS! foiling his evil plans, and not to mention dropping him in the pool of acid. Throughout most of the film, they don't even know who each other are. Bruce has to discover that the Joker was the guy who killed his parents, and the Joker has to learn that Bruce Wayne is Batman. The first time they met, Bruce was just a child, and the Joker was Jack Napier, just a regular crook who got away. This is only shown in a flashback, but during the present-day course of the film, the two of them confront each other three times. 
The first time, it's Batman against Jack Napier. The second time, it's Bruce Wayne against the Joker. And finally, it's Batman against the Joker. Every possible combination. And in between all that, the Joker tries to take Batman's girl. It's no wonder he wants to beat the shit out of him. In the role of Bruce Wayne's butler, Alfred, is Michael Goff. Not too much to say, but just a well-done and consistent performance. He continued his role as Alfred through Batman Returns, Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin, as reliable as the good butler he is. The music by Danny Elfman, what can I say? It's incredible. So yes, the music plays a big part in the movie, but there's also a couple songs in there by Prince, Party Man and Trust. These make the movie seem real outdated, and there is also a really stupid music video also by Prince called The Bat Dance. Don't remember it? Well, you're not missing much. There's also a lot of really strange moments. When Batman's flying around in the Nightwing, he sees the Joker on the ground just standing there with his arms out. He locks onto his target and then he fires away with everything he's got. But somehow he misses. First of all, what went wrong? And second, how'd the Joker know that Batman was such a terrible shot? Then he pulls a long gun out of his pants, fires one single bullet and takes him down. While it's not the most realistic film, it doesn't have to be. It has a surreal atmosphere and a unique style. I love it. But when I see it today, it still has a powerful effect on me. I give it four and a half Joker dollars. After the success of what people now refer to as the first of the modern Batman movies, it was followed by the highly anticipated Batman Returns. Tim Burton was given full reign to do whatever he wants. The result is stylish and artistic, but unfortunately it alienated mainstream audiences. Michael Keaton returns as Batman, but this time there's not much focus on his character. It's all about the villains, and not one, but three. First there's a corrupt business guy played by Christopher Walken. The name of the character is Max Shrek, which is the name of the actor who played Nosferatu, the oldest existing Dracula film from 1922. But of course I'm the horror movie guy, so I always notice that stuff. Then there's the Penguin, played by Danny DeVito. His performance comes off as being a little exaggerated, but I think they really nailed the character. He's not a bad guy who becomes evil just for the hell of it. He's a confused and sad misfit who just wants to be accepted in a society. Last is Selina Kyle, also known as the Catwoman, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. One of the strangest scenes in the whole movie is when she actually becomes Catwoman. But it might actually be my favorite moment, not for what happens, but for the buildup. You know, for a second there, you really frightened me. <laughs> oh man, that's so funny. So anyway, she hits the ground, a bunch of cats come out of nowhere, start crawling all over, chewing her fingers, she blinks her eyes a bunch of times, which is real creepy, and then she regains consciousness. So she destroys her apartment, goes on a rampage through some department stores, just prances around, does a bunch of flips, blows things up, but she fights criminals too. Really, I don't understand what she wants. She's just crazy. The good thing is she spends a lot of screen time fighting Batman. And what it all boils down to is you just gotta have some action. While none of the Batman movies really excel at action, this one at least has a lot of it. It also makes great use of the famous Wilhelm scream. But many Batman fans have complained that Batman isn't supposed to kill anyone. And I never even thought about it. I just wanted to see him kick some ass. And what about the first movie? You're saying he didn't kill anyone? What about the guy he bashes his head in the bell and throws down the cathedral? And in the early comics, Batman killed criminals all the time. For some reason, one of my favorite parts is where the Penguin is making a public speech, and Batman plays a pre-recorded comment that he made over the loudspeaker. What's funny is that he keeps repeating it over and over, and then he does this record scratch thing. Like I almost thought there was going to be like some kind of rap song or something. And where does everybody get vegetables to throw? But for me, the weirdest scene is the part where the penguin bites the guy's nose. That always struck me as being out of place. Why was it necessary? It definitely wasn't a kid's movie. In fact, McDonald's were all set to do a Happy Meal promotion like they usually do, but cancel it because the movie was so violent. When I first saw this movie, I loved it, but I was 12 years old, and each time I see it, it gets worse. To most people, it's too dark, it's depressing and weird, but I like it. Then again, I'm a sick bastard. Bottom line, it's a Tim Burton movie. It's his trademark style with a strong mood, but it's certainly not his best movie, nor the best Batman movie. I don't really recommend it, but it's not that bad either. I give it three Happy Meals wrapped in chains, dripping blood with dead cats and penguins impaled on it with knives. 
and a killer bat on top. For the third installment in the Warner Brothers Batman series, they decide to wimp out and go a little more mainstream. Gone was the darkness, gone was the demented quirkiness, and gone was both Tim Burton and Michael Keaton. In the directing chair was Joel Schumacher, and in the bat suit was Val Kilmer. Definitely not the best Batman, but that's all up for debate. Robin makes his first appearance in the series, played by Chris O'Donnell. He throws a bad attitude about everything. Yeah, all he does is complain, but it's a substantial update since the 1960s. Gosh. Now the villains. First there's Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones. It's strange that Harvey Dent, played by Billy D. Williams, makes his appearance in the first Tim Burton movie before he becomes Two-Face. But for whatever reason, they never followed up on it properly. So here at the beginning of Batman Forever, he's already Two-Face and only a passing mention that he got burned by acid. For your dying pleasure, we are serving the very same acid that made us the men we are today! <laughs> I can't exactly put my finger on it, but there's just something incredibly bland about this character. To begin with, he's a split personality like Jekyll and Hyde, which has a lot of potential, but here, it isn't conveyed very effectively. All he does is flip a coin and laugh a lot. Then there's Jim Carrey as the Riddler. He's given a lot more backstory than Two-Face, and he's the primary villain. Of course they went with the biggest actor they could have possibly found. Right after Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber, everybody was talking about Jim Carrey all the time. So it's no doubt that he was a big juicy piece of bait for this movie. His performance is similar to the original Frank Gorshin Riddler, but when I watch him goofing around in this role, I can't separate the actor from the character. It's just Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. Spank me. Who spank you? Whenever he's in a scene, the whole focus is on him. Watch how Two-Face just chuckles along. Kill the bear! Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, he completely steals the show. And not only does the Riddler dominate the movie, but so does the color green. There's lasers and all kinds of weird contraptions. Whenever I think of this movie, I immediately think of green. But the whole film is a flashy neon light show. When I say it's brighter than Batman Returns, it's very literal because the whole thing is eye candy. Speaking of eye candy, there's the love interest Dr. Chase Meriden played by Nicole Kitman. Her character, again, is pretty shallow. Black rubber. That's every guy's dream, to be able to dress like a bat and have women go crazy over you. I tried it, it doesn't work. It's the car, right? Chicks love the car. One of the biggest complaints that a lot of people had were the nipples on the bat suit. I don't know why it was such a big deal, but now that I look at it, yeah, what purpose do they have? If they shot bullets or something, that would at least have some kind of functionality. Or maybe the suit fits so tight his nipples are actually inside the nipple part. Oh, whatever, I'm talking about this way too much. Of course, there's the Riddler crotch grab and the infamous badass shot. But let's not get into that. Anyway, the whole plot of this movie is all about backstories. Two-Face killed Robin's parents and he wants revenge. There's a more detailed flashback of how Bruce Wayne became Batman, and a story arc of Batman growing more accepting to the idea of having a sidekick. Overall, it's actually a pretty entertaining movie. It's definitely a return to the more campy fare. Even the final shot of Batman and Robin running toward the screen is reminiscent of the 60s TV show. Not to mention, when Batman has to escape from a death trap, it's definitely a throwback to the old cliffhangers. For the most part, Batman Forever was pretty well received. Some may argue that it's closer to what a comic book movie should be than the Tim Burton ones, but I can't help but feel that this one is just dumbing it down for a wider audience. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through I give it two and a half bat asses. All right, stay tuned next week. We're going to wrap up the history of Batman, finish it off with the Dark Knight. It's Cinemassacre's Batathon. Now it seemed Batman movies would come in pairs. Schumacher was immediately hired to direct the follow up, Batman and Robin. This one is widely regarded as being the absolute worst. But you know what? It's a comedy. There's no way I could be convinced that it was meant to pass as a real Batman film. It goes beyond the camp appeal of the 60s show. This one is just plain silly. Come on, sing! Louder, come on, sing, sing, sing! That sums it all up. That's the villain, Mr. Freeze, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. An interesting choice. Anyone who's reviewed this film will mention that all of his dialogue consists of puns. But it's no exaggeration, because literally everything he says has something to do with ice or cold. The Iceman 
cometh. All right, everyone. Chill. Allow me to break the ice. Hell freeze is over. Cool party. You are not sending me to the cool. Freeze. I see graveyard. Cold. Freeze. Freeze. Freeze where? Well. Stay cool. Be cold, Batman. Chill. The ice age. Let's kick some ice. Batman's played by George Clooney, a good choice, but he doesn't help the horrendousness of the film, and he must have felt embarrassed delivering such bad lines. Chicks dig the car. This is why Superman works alone. Yes, Batman mentioned Superman. Oh my god. Then of course there's the Bat credit card. I honestly could never believe I saw that, but I'm staring at it right now and it's true. Poison Ivy, Batgirl, and Bane are all added in, but instead of it being awesome, it just becomes a mess. It was more geared towards kids and to promote a line of action figures. I remember going to Six Flags theme park and going on the roller coaster Batman and Robin the Chiller, and I was thinking to myself, I can't believe they named this thing after one of the worst movies ever made. But the ride was pretty cool. I don't think I need to list any more reasons why this movie sucks the big one. Everybody knows it, but I'd like to plead it's a comedy and it's hilarious. But is that what Batman fans wanted? A spoof? No, not at all. And to the studio, it was just a dumb superhero movie and nothing more. Not treated the way it should be. I give it one ice cube. After Batman and Robin, the idea of another Batman film seemed like a waste of time. As the series got progressively worse and degenerated to that point, it was time to leave Batman to rest. But behind the scenes, there was already another one almost ready to go, Batman Triumphant, but it got shit-canned due to the poor reception of Batman Robin. There were rumors floating around that one of the villains would be Scarecrow and that he'd be played by Howard Stern. Over the years, there were several other Batman movies in the works, including a prequel based on the Frank Miller series, Batman Year One. There is also Batman vs. Superman, but they pulled the plug on that as well. Who would have thought that would be successful? Two of the most well-loved superheroes in one film? What a bad idea. So nearly a decade since the last Batman film, what eventually came to be was Batman Begins, directed by Christopher Nolan. The polar opposite of Batman and Robin, everyone was speechless about how much they loved this movie. It makes me wonder what kind of euphoric gas they used in the theater. The general consensus was that not only was it the best Batman movie, it was the best one by far. I do think it's the best one since the 1989 Tim Burton one, and I know I'm completely a minority on this, but I'm sorry, Batman Begins is overrated. Should I just pretend that I'm enraptured and go along with the crowd? Or should I voice my honest opinion? Well, whether you agree or not, here it goes. First of all, I'm not entirely interested in how Batman became Batman. Don't we see a flashback of that in Batman and in Batman Forever? So why do we need half a movie all about it? Also, once he becomes Batman, it feels as if a new plot has just started. It's much more well-written than lots of the previous Batman films, but I just think that out of two and a half hours, they could have cut some of it down. I wasn't much a fan of the dialogue and tone of this movie. It came off as a bit pretentious. When you take the bare basics, Batman's a guy who dresses like a bat and fights crime. Now, I know there's a lot more to it than that, but any way you look at it, it still is a guy in a bat costume. Now, to me, there's a limit to how serious that you can take that, and to me personally, I just felt like the emotions that they were trying to convey in this movie just didn't work for me a whole lot. It clashed with the realism it was trying to set about how a guy can pursue a life of crime fighting as the Batman. I was real disappointed in the villains. I've been looking forward to Scarecrow for almost a decade, and for the most part I liked him, a psychopathic psychiatrist or whatever who sprays people with fear-inducing gas. I think the overall theme of the movie was fear. Everyone who gets sprayed with this gas sees their own unique hallucinations. For example, Batman's fear is of bats, the image which he takes on himself, and the idea of Scarecrow forcing him to confront that fear again seemed pretty interesting to me. I was more excited about seeing a darker, scarier villain than the flashier cheeseball ones of before. But once Scarecrow actually becomes Scarecrow and rides off into the night terrorizing everybody, he's only there for a few minutes, and then Rachel zaps him with a taser or something, and that's all we get. I expected some kind of confrontation with Batman, but it didn't happen, and instead Scarecrow, my most anticipated villain, takes a backseat to this other guy, Ra's al Ghul. 
I wasn't much a fan of his expressionless face and monotone voice. He's a villain with interesting motives, but in this film, he comes off to me as a cliché. Through most of the movie, he goes by the name Ducard and always has a decoy with him taking his real name, Raz al Ghul. But even when the decoy is killed, there's another one who only appears on screen for a few seconds. What's the point of the whole decoy thing? In the beginning when he's training Bruce, why do they use real swords? The action scenes are some of the worst ever. Whenever Batman is fighting somebody, everything's shot in extreme close-up. The editing is just a random mess. Sometimes I can't even tell what's going on. And I know Batman intimidates criminals, but does he have to speak in that growly voice? Where were the other drugs going? I've also found it a little strange how accepting Alfred is over the whole situation. Bruce Wayne comes back after seven years, then suddenly decides he wants to dress like a bad and fight crime, and Alfred's just like, okay. I know he respects his master's decision, but it just seemed to me like something was missing. How does Batman survive being set on fire and then falling from a rooftop? I don't think we needed an explanation of how the bat signal came to be. It's a searchlight with a bat symbol, that's all we really need to know. And if someone was tied to a searchlight, wouldn't they suffer any burns? I'm no expert in thermodynamics or whatever, but I know that if I touch a light bulb that's been on for a while, it burns. I also didn't really like the tumbler, but I'm all for updating the image of the Batmobile. The 1960s version looked perfect for the 60s, the Tim Burton one looked perfect for the 80s and 90s, but this is way overdone. Does Batman really need something so excessive? I've also felt that only Batman should drive the Batmobile. Why does Gordon have to drive it? Now, after all my complaining, you probably think I hate this movie, but no, I didn't. In fact, I was able to sit through it three times, which says a lot for me. What I'm doing is what you call nitpicking. Yeah, you know, when everybody bitched and ranted about Spider-Man posing in front of the American flag, or when Indiana Jones hid in a refrigerator from an atom bomb blast. People complain about everything, which makes me wonder why everyone thinks Batman Begins is so perfect. But I think it's okay. So relax, it's my own opinion, and at least I gave my reasons. I didn't mean to bash it, but it already gets enough praise as it is. I give it three oversized bat tanks. Once a follow-up to Batman Begins was announced, I gotta admit, I didn't even have a guess what the title would be. Batman Begins 2, Batman Continues, but once it was revealed, The Dark Knight, I was like, hey, that's not bad. And it just hit me, if they make another Rocky, it'll be called the Italian Stallion. The hype was, and still is, ridiculous, especially with the unfortunate passing of Heath Ledger. Things got really blown out of proportion. You can't turn on the TV or leave the house without seeing the Dark Knight all over the place. It's really annoying, but I ignored it all, just went to see the movie Friday afternoon, and it was pretty good. Yeah, I'm literally making this video right after seeing it, so keep in mind, it's too early to really evaluate it, and everybody's probably talking about it enough already. So I don't think there's really much I have to add. I also made a decision not to see it in IMAX because I wanted a genuine impression. It doesn't need to be in IMAX to be good. First of all, the action sequences were much better this time around. Not only involving more vehicles and explosions, but the hand-to-hand -hand combat scenes were photographed and edited in a more coherent manner. About the plot, I don't want to give anything away, but it's what you'd expect. It's Batman, but with plenty of storylines and enough themes to keep it satisfying. Being that he's already Batman and everything's established, I thought this movie would be significantly shorter than the last one. But no, it's a little bit longer actually, and that's really my only gripe. It was plagued by a lot of those brooding dialogue scenes that I don't care for. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Reminds me of when Rambo said, live for nothing or die for something. Live this, die that, live free or die hard, cut me a break. I also didn't like the ending, but I won't spoil it. I thought the new vehicle, the Bat Pod, was pretty cool. When the tumbler blew up, I was like, yeah, fuck that hunk of junk. Michael Caine and Morgan Freeman are both great, and they've now set into me as honored Batman characters. I look forward to seeing them in more. Scarecrow's only in the movie for about five minutes. You can imagine my disappointment to see my favorite villain once again tossed aside like a shitty pair of underwear. But Harvey Dent, also known as Two-Face, is great. Makes up for Batman forever by a mile. I'll leave it at that. But the villain everybody's talking about is the Joker. 
I'm sick of the question, who's the best Joker? Well, comparing Heath Ledger to Jack Nicholson is like comparing Jack Nicholson to Cesar Romero. It's two completely different things. But I'm happy with all three Jokers. At first, I was skeptical, but I think Heath Ledger did a great job. But still, I prefer Nicholson by far. But that's not the point. This is an original Joker. He doesn't try to imitate any others, and he doesn't even laugh as often as you might expect. But there are two scenes which I think are little tributes to the Tim Burton movie, but both with a unique twist. You might even already know what I'm talking about. The only complaint I have with the Joker is that he's too invincible. Intimidating a mob of criminals and escaping from the police, way too easy. To sum it up, I enjoyed this movie, but it was a little long and a little pretentious, but overall, pretty good. I give it four pencils in the eye. So this ends Cinemassacre's Batathon. Stay tuned for more of my movie reviews coming up. I'll catch you later.